All right, Dennis. Dennis, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Brooklyn, New York. Um, Dyker Heights, very good neighborhood. You know, um, my mother, my father, my brother, you know, uh, a dog very much picture perfect. I mean, as far as my childhood goes, with the exception of my older brother, I mean, I had a wonderful childhood, wonderful family, a lot of love, um, you know, really nothing negative. And then when you get to my brother, there's every kind of abuse you could possibly imagine to the point where it was like uh, living with Freddy Krueger. So your relationship with your brother was, was not ideal? Yeah, I mean, at this point, it's barely civil, high and by. We text each other on birthdays, and that's about it. He was physically abusive. You know, um, when I was 12, he was walking the dog. I followed him on a bike, and he had six of his friends kick the shit out of me. You know, um, he hit on my girlfriends or, you know, girls that I was talking to just as emotionally and physically abusive as you could possibly get. Um, you know, funny part is he hated the fact that I got involved in drugs, but he's the one who gave me my first joint. Um, and he's also, in my opinion, an undiagnosed alcoholic. So, you know, who's the pot and who's the kettle? But your childhood with your, fam with your family was good? It was, it was excellent. You know, uh, I, I couldn't have gotten more love, couldn't have gotten more support. You know, my parents, both wonderful people. Uh, my mom was a teacher. My father worked a lot. Um, very close-knit extended family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. Um, really couldn't have asked for better. Um, you know, just wonderful people. And you've had jobs? I have had jobs. I started when I was 16, 17, humping cases in a liquor store. And then I wound up managing that same store. And the, uh, that kind of turned into a nice career. I was able to catch on with one of the distributors as a, you know, I started as a merchandiser and then I wound up a salesman. By the time I was 24, 25, I was making about 180,000 a year. Um, you know, for somebody who possibly has addiction issues, Beverage alcohol, probably not the best business to be in. But um, by the time I was 31, 32, that kind of came to a screeching halt. I had gotten a DWI and uh, they allowed me to resign. And that was the last corporate career type job I've had. I have been a personal trainer. Um, I lived in Florida for a number of years, so that was the bulk of my business, that and a boxing instructor. That went very, very well. Um, and other than that, I mean, just bouncing around phone rooms and, you know, uh, odds and ends, menial jobs. And then, uh, of course, you know, hustling. You know, uh, if somebody gets a prescription, flip it for them, or, you know, picking stuff up for people. I mean, there's, there's always ways to make a decent buck. Did the harder drug use start after you lost your job? Uh, I think the harder drug use contributed to the loss of a job, uh, to the loss of my career. Um, but yeah, definitely, I mean, at that point, I don't even think I had shot up yet. Uh, after, the, after the career, I went to Florida and moved into a halfway house. And that was where I shot up the first time. My, uh, my friend Kenny, who since has overdosed and died, uh, he didn't want to do it, begged me not to. You know, I didn't understand that at the time. And now I understand that like, I, I would eat a bullet before I introduced somebody to that monster. Um, you know, and I, I fell in love with it instantly. And as soon as I discovered opiates in the needle, that was when it stopped being fun. You know, prior to that, it was pot, it was X, it was Coke on the weekends, drinking, you know, I mean, always excessive, but uh, at least controlled, hidden, or, you know, um, wasn't painfully obvious. But with the opiates, it got very obvious very quick, and it stopped being fun. It was, I discovered my true love, and fun went right out the window. It became, you know, uh, uh, something that almost like my existence was devoted to it. So you smoke hair, or you inject heroin, but it's, is it heroin or is it fentanyl now? Uh, 
these days, I don't think you could find heroin without fentanyl. Um, I'm sure there's fentanyl in there. I've never tested it. I would be shocked if there wasn't. Um, what is the, what is, you, you put, you mix it with crack? Yeah, I, uh, my typical shot involves uh, two to three twenties of crack and maybe a half a bundle, which is like five bags of heroin. You know, I uh, dilute it with vinegar to get the chemical, you know, to neutralize the chemicals in the crack and I inject it. And the combination of those two, they're almost opposite drugs. Uh, they are, but they do complement each other in a way. I mean, uh, with cocaine, you wind up zipping around, you know, um, crack cocaine, you wind up zipping around, you're like, uh, like the roadrunner. And with heroin, you know, I always tell people it's like somebody cracks an egg on your forehead and it just kind of droops down with this warm, fuzzy, you know, I love everything feeling. That's um, almost euphoric, but, um, you know, one takes the edge off the other and they do complement each other very well in that regard. You know, um, it, it's like uh, a lot of times you see people who are just straight dopers, that, you know, and they're drooling or the, the term we use is, oh, look at him, he's sucking his own dick, you know, you're hunched over like that. And um, that doesn't happen. So it's like you're conscious enough to actually enjoy the, the high. And how do you support yourself? I mean, there's, there's always a lot of hustles. You know, um, thankfully, my family is, um, you know, they help out where they can. Um, you know, every now and then I'll, you know, come up with a job. Somebody needs something done, you know, uh, want something like that. But a lot of wheeling and dealing, you know, uh, who's got a prescription for 130 Roxy's? Okay, pick it up for 18, dump it for 26. You know, that kind of thing. Um, people wanting product and not knowing where to go. So, you know, get that for them and add 20%. Um, you know, a lot of hustles, a lot of running around. And I mean, honestly, half the time, I don't know how the hell I fund my habit. I got almost a $300 a day habit. I have no idea how the hell I come up with the money sometimes. And having a habit like this, you must have some crazy stories of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you could say that. You could say that. Um, I'm, I'm actually one of the few people that could say the crack saved their life. I had, when I was in Florida at one point, I had gotten very low and I decided I wanted to check out. So I took about $200 worth of dope and I put it in a rig. I said, you know what, just for good measure, I threw a 50 of crack in there. Well, four hours later, I came to thinking that hell looked a lot like the hotel room that I was you know, shooting up in the night before. And uh, then I realized that the crack probably kept my heart pumping and saved my life. You know, um, there was another time I coded out in the hospital. I was there for a shoulder surgery, went in the bathroom to boot up. You know, a friend came by with some stuff. And I coded out and took a ride on the flat line. And I remember to this day, this actually scared me. Like, I can't even tell you how much. Um, but when I was coming to, it wasn't, you know, they had me on the, the wooden thing with the, they were trying to get that orange shit around my head. And I, mean, I started flailing like a fish out of water because coming out of that, when they gave me the Narcan, I didn't see people. I mean, a lot of people, I guess, see different things. The mind hallucinates or whatever it is, but it, it looked like demons to the point where I started flailing around big time and fighting them. And one of the nurses told me it took like 11 of them to hold me down and get me to stop moving around like that. Um, but then, you know, that kind of meshed back into reality not long after, you know, maybe 30 seconds, a minute after, and I realized what was going on. And, um, you know, and that was it. So they kept me for an extra two days prior to the surgery. And uh, yeah, thankfully I was in the hospital when I coded though, because it turns out even though I tried attempting suicide once, I'm not that keen to go. How do you think your years of living this lifestyle have changed you? Oof. Um, you know, you start out and you have a clear sense of who you are, what you'll do, what you won't do. And then, you know, something happens and one thing doesn't seem wrong and another thing doesn't seem wrong and another thing doesn't seem wrong. And even though there are certain lines that you, you don't cross and places that you just won't go, 
you know, you almost wind up not being able to recognize yourself. You know, it, it's it's almost like, uh, I always tell people it's almost like a washing machine. You know, you just over and over and you get your head up for a little bit of air and then it's right back down to the bottom. And, you know, um, as much as I hate the Godfather 3, it's just when I thought I was out, they pull me back in, that kind of thing. You know, um, it, it definitely takes a toll and it leaves you with a self-image that resembles probably what you would scrape off the bottom of your boot or sheep farm. You know, um, I, I don't have a high opinion of myself in any way, shape, or form. I mean, you know... I, I, I believe addiction is not really a drug problem. I think it's a self-worth problem. I agree to a point. I think the one common factor that I've found in everybody that deals with addiction is some major type of trauma along the lines of heartache, betrayal, you know, um, that's very deeply rooted in their belief system about themselves, or at least that's how it is for me. And that's what I've experienced, but I, I agree wholeheartedly. I don't think that drugs are the problem for anybody that does drugs. I think they do drugs because that's the solution. And the problem lays within that, you know. Self-worth. Yeah. And for your, in your case, it was your brother. Yeah. Yeah, my brother and my my uh, my first love, actually, who or the love of my life to this day. I I wish I never met her, but she's the love of my life. There was nothing I wouldn't have done for her. Broke me up into a million pieces. Um, definitely secondary to my brother, but there, nonetheless. But heartache, trauma, and you know the uh, resulting self worth that comes from that, or lack thereof. Perfect recipe for addiction. You spent time in jail or prison? I have been to county jail in Florida. I spent four months. Uh, first time I got arrested was three pills. Wound up going to drug court, which, I mean, they, they set you up to fail. They might as well just, you know, do away with the program because you're going back in. I think they have a graduation rate of like 8%. So, um, you know, I wound up violating I dropped out of that and then I violated probation with another possession charge and it was go to jail, go directly to jail, do not pass go. Uh, that was in Broward County. Now it's funny, they have the highest recidivism rate in the country and the second busiest jail um, only to, second only to Las Vegas. Uh, they have four jails, two prison runs a week and one pill was what put me back in there for four months. Which, I mean, you know what, I've, I've gotten away with so much, you almost can't even get mad. It's almost just like, okay, you know what, fine, you got me on something. And that's, that's how I kept myself from getting bitter. Um, you know, because when I get bitter, then a lot of more bad things can happen. You know. What would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in your life? Oh boy, um, there's a few that I really can't place above the others. You know, um, you know, it really sucks when you learn that it's always a friend that hates you the most, that there's nobody that wouldn't hurt you if it would help them, you know, um, obviously excluding family in most, you know, in a lot of cases or most cases or healthy cases, whatever, whatever the hell that means, you know, um, it just it, it makes you feel very alone, you know, uh, inconsequential. And that's not a good thing, feeling that isolated from everything, because it makes the self-destructive behavior a lot easier. You know, um, I, I really hate the fact that hindsight's twenty twenty, but, um, you know, I'm sure everybody has the uh, time machine scenario in their head. There's really, with all the stupid things that I've done, all the times I went left that I wish I should have went right, um, if I could go back to when I was 14, 15, there's only one thing that I would change. Only one. Um, I would listen with blind obedience to absolutely every syllable, suggestion, idea, like, anything and everything that my parents ever said with blind obedience. 
you know, w without question. That's the only thing I would change. What's your biggest fear? My biggest fear, oh boy. Um, my biggest fear is that this is it. You know, um, that it's just this shallow, hollow existence, you know, kind of limping on until you wind up six feet on the, you know, um, however you get there, which I mean, in this life, there's more than one way, uh, none of them fun, but uh, that, that this is all there is, that there's not more. I mean, look, if, if somebody could wave a wand then I could stop tomorrow, I, I would do it in a heartbeat. But, you know, they talk about, okay, you got in trouble, you went in, you did your thing, you know, you paid your debt to society, but that's, that's complete and total bullshit. Because when I got out, I was gung ho. I was going to conquer the world. I was going to get back into the, you know, into the workforce. And you continue to pay your debt every time you fill out a job application. There's a lot of places that say they hire felons, you know, and they get their tax breaks and all, but they have a certain number that they have to carry on. But then finding places that say they do things, that's one thing. Finding places that actually do them, you know, or do it for more than a quota for a tax break, that's another story altogether. So I'm, I'm still paying that debt. And for what? For, for possession of four pills? I didn't shoot anybody. I didn't, you know, siphon millions of dollars out of somebody's bank account or anything else. I mean, it was like a possession charge and it's following me with everything that I try to do. So how many times can you beat your head against that wall or against that door and they just, you know, go away, come back another time or can't do it because this is, you know, something that happened years ago. I mean, how long until you just kind of get fed up and give up and retreat to what you know, you know? And in this case, it's when the plunger goes down, it doesn't matter what's going on, everything goes away. Nothing else matters, you know? Is that what the heroin does? It just helps make everything feel all right? Yeah, it's... Um, and then the crack too, to a degree, it, you know, it numbs everything out, but it, uh, it just, whatever's going on, that layer of bullshit that's always eating away at you, whatever your, your worries, your stresses are, it just totally on the back burner and everything is all fuzzy roses and dandelion fields and you, you could really give a shit about anything because it just all goes away. It's like, like I said earlier, that egg cracks and it's just like, and, and that lasts for how long? nothing else matters. Uh, it depends on the dope. I mean, look, I, I've got a heavy habit. I, I burn probably about three hundred dollars a day. Um, you know, sometimes I don't come up with that much, but I generally, you know, don't have an issue with uh, with too much of an issue. But um, sometimes that initial feeling, unfortunately, doesn't last very long. But the actual high, where you could just kind of lay back and and just kind of be with an equilibrium that you wouldn't have if, you know, you weren't high. It could be anywhere from a half hour to two, three hours. Depends on the stuff. Do you have kids? No. No kids? No, thankfully no kids, never been married. I actually, truthfully, uh, I, a couple of years ago, I, I just started assuming that I was shooting blanks because the fact that I never, got that phone call um, am amazed me. What was the lowest point of your life? Or is this it now? Oh boy. Um, lowest, I mean, look, watching my mother die was, um, was very difficult, but that wasn't about me, that was about her. Um, <laughs> Lowest point in my life, my father and I were getting into it. I mean, this lasts all of a few seconds, but it was by far the most impactful. Um, you know, we were going back and forth, heated discussion regarding addiction and some of the things that I was, you know, doing to myself. And he said to me, you know, first he was yelling, and then he said to me in a very calm voice, which I mean, anybody who's ever had a heated discussion with their father, once that voice gets calm, you kind of know 
there's a bomb about to drop. And he said to me, I'm, I'm ashamed that you have the same name I do. And that I, I don't think I ever felt like a bigger piece of shit than in that moment. You know, um, I mean, I had uh, another guy who owned a halfway house tell me at one point that I was the best and worst he had ever met as far as addicts go. And I was actually stupid enough to take that as a compliment. But, um, you know, not long after he said, uh, you know, you're a vicious, vicious drug addict. And, you know, by far the worst I've ever seen in that regard. And that, uh, that didn't feel good. Like even this, doing this whole interview, you know, um, I mean, I, I know you have this uh, thing going with YouTube, you blow up, you know, you're blowing up and a lot of people see it. And the only time anybody wants to hear from me or anything about my story is about the absolute worst that has gone on in my life, the things that I've done to myself, to others, that, that doesn't feel good. You know, that um, that's what somebody wants to know about or somebody's asking about the, the thing that you try and keep, you know, in the back of the closet so nobody else could see, you know, and um, yeah, that. What, what, do you, what do you think would turn it around for you? What do you think would possibly get you to Put the drugs down and straighten it. You know, I only had success with it. Any any time I put the drugs down, it, the focus always went from drugs to not being on drugs. Problem was, whether your focus is on doing them or not doing them, your focus is still on drugs. You know, I had success at a Christian rehab, um, but then you get out into the real world and there's a lack of opportunity because you're still checking that box that says felon. You know, um, but again, the only success I ever had was just going back to a real life with, you know, um, a career opportunity or, you know, a job. I mean, I, I would need an opportunity to really, you know, if somebody would give me a chance, um, I mean, look, it's with no ego that I say this, but so many people have told me that if I could just put my energy and focus into something positive, that it would almost be scary. And that's, you know, I, I, I hate what I do. I hate myself for doing it, but it's so much easier to keep doing it because there's no opportunity for any different, because it's still just that box, you know, do you have a felony? You know, it, it's my entire fucking life. Paid my debt to society, my ass, every time I fill out a job application. You know, people aren't lining up to hire guys like me. 